we we'll now start to think about the next um, presentation, which is um, from Lara Young um, from Costains. And so Lara has lots of things to do with carbon. Um, she's group carbon manager for Costain Group um, and she's energy and carbon manager of the year in 2021. Um, lots of initiatives on sustainability um, and driving through the net zero um, initiative for, for Costain, challenging business models, etc. And Lara is also leading the integration of the world's first standard for managing infrastructure carbon in the past 2008 uh, within the Costain group. Um, so um, in addition to all of that, um, I was also um, listed uh, for the uh, eighth great women list for International Women's Day. And on top of all of those things, it's also Lara's birthday today, so she's, she's given up her birthday to, <laughs> to present to us today. So without any more uh, going on, I'll, I'll introduce you now to, to Lara, Lara Young, who's going to talk about Costain's carbon reduction initiatives. Thank you. Thank you and hi everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it is my birthday today indeed as well, but um, I am delighted to be here and um, hopefully to help provide, I think there was an awesome presentation from Matt around what Anglia are doing, some of the really brilliant stuff. So what I'm going to try and cover is to try and really help bring to life how Costain as an organisation has gone about addressing and really trying to or setting out how we as an organisation also that wider remit genuinely achieving net zero um, and the idea of what I'm looking to convey is also pointing out the key themes of how we went about it not one prescriptive solution as to this is the only way because I think a key point to note around making net zero as reality is there isn't a one size fits all so the session or what I'm going to try and cover is around really illustrating how we went about it and the application of that principle can be transposed to whatever type of organisation, the scale, the size and the activity. So yeah, if Rebecca could please move on to the next slide, that would be brilliant. Um, and the next one again, sorry. So with regards to that, I thought what would be helpful is before going straight into what Costain have done and all the great things around that, who are Costain for those of you that don't necessarily work with us or maybe haven't come across us as much. Um, so Costain is an infrastructure, a smart infrastructure solutions provider. What does that actually mean? Essentially is as an organisation, we work across the pretty much the entire life cycle stages of any infrastructure or major infrastructure um, project um, and so and that's got anything to do <laughs> thank you very much for the happy birthday wishes and um, and essentially so what do cost do essentially we work in anything to do with transportation so be that aviation be that um, railway highways anything to do with water networks and anything to do with energy networks so in addition to um, carbon capture and storage and uh, clean hydrogen as an example um, and throughout that, as I mentioned, we can, we're probably the most well known within the complex delivery space. However, we do a lot of work being involved at a very early design phase, so really setting out the scene of understanding, and that can be a very concept design, detailed design. And then we come all the way through to asset optimization. So a big part of what we do is also working with existing infrastructure to optimize the resilience around it. So that was just to give a flavor of where and how the examples of what I'm going to run through um, and in what space it's um, being conveyed in. However, just to make clear, it's definitely the principles that I'm going to outline are very much transposable to any type of organisations. They might not all be applicable, but definitely will be applicable to a certain, in a certain manner. So if we can just move to the next slide, please. So, why has, this slide was just to sort of illustrate that whilst we've maybe not been as good as we could have been around communicating and our industry's probably not been great at actually recognizing what we've done so far this isn't just a knee-jerk reaction and there's and, and, and Costain isn't the only organization that's been doing stuff in really addressing 
are carbon emissions. There's actually been a huge amount of effort within the industry. Yes, there is 100% more to do, and that definitely needs to be accelerated. But what it does demonstrate is there already has been a significant improvement, um, and that it, this is achievable to do. This isn't suddenly just something coated, totally new. Um, and very much our journey is demonstrating that whilst, so Costain, this is Costain's breakdown of our group emissions over the last decade or so. Um, but what it does help try and illustrate is actually we've been really good um, in up till now, really focusing on what are our direct group emissions. Um, so, um, and there's still some things that we need to achieve reducing, but actually we've made some good strides where we haven't been as great so far, but definitely addressing this and continuing to do so is everything that's indirect. So outside of our direct scope of emission, so everything that falls into that scope three stuff, we've kind of as an industry dabbled in it, but not really taken it to town. So what I'm going to outline from now is that actually everything that I'm going to talk about is very much in our whole plan and a whole approach around how we're getting to net zero very much focuses on that whole picture so we've stopped trying to work and break it down into whether it's a direct indirect scope one two or three it doesn't really matter what we've done is understand and painted the whole pictures of or the whole picture of the organizational footprint be it what we're directly responsible for and what we're indirectly responsible for and um, to really help pinpoint and and um, identify where we actually need to reduce that and it's building on what we've done to date so what i'm actually going to illustrate of how we're getting to net zero and how essentially the industry is doing there whilst there are certain elements that need innovation to continue i don't think there will be anything that shocking the whole point is actually we kind of know all the answers already we might not have all of the solutions however we do know the key areas but the difference is actually now making that actually happen. So if we move on to the next slide, please, that'd be great. So what I'm showing here is our climate change action plan. And essentially building on that whole life cycle approach that I just mentioned is, you know, we're taking our whole um, life cycle footprint as an organisation. Um, essentially what you're hearing, what you're seeing here is our plan and it fits on one page um, as to how we as an organisation are going to help not just ourselves, uh, not just our clients and our supply chain, but ensuring that how leading the entire industry in actually tangibly reducing our emissions. Um, it does fit on a page and to reassure whilst it does fit on a page, um, there is a lot of detail and information that sits behind this document to inform why we've ta targeted the areas we have why we've set down some of the dates we have, etc. So there is a lot of detail that sits behind this um, to help inform it. However, realistically, our plan can fit on a page. So there's some key reasons for that, and I will go into that in a bit more detail. But just some highlights of what um, take away the points from our climate change action plan. So as you'll see, the big date on there is 2035. So we've set out an organisation that we're going to help achieve net zero and this is across our whole life cycle footprint by 2035 so that's addressing our direct emissions but very much those of our supply chain but essentially a huge proportion is also within our clients footprint um, there's two key reasons as to why 2035 and not before um, and there is no right or wrong answer for an organization doesn't mean that everyone will be 2035 and um, some potentially will be sooner some potentially will be later but the reason we have goes that we have set out on 2035 it's not just a number picked out the air there is informed data behind this but essentially when we went about mapping out okay what is our whole life cycle footprint where do these big hot spots lie and i will go into more details to what they are exactly essentially it pin pinpointed four key areas and of those four key areas what we identified is um mapped out the the current roadmaps of how those areas are going to be net zero or plan to achieve net zero. And essentially, whilst there are some areas that are addressable and do need to happen, what we've identified is that a significant proportion, if not over three quarters of the emissions that we're actually addressing through this plan, do not directly sit within our costings direct footprint. 
So interestingly, we don't have direct control over these emissions. That doesn't mean we can't do anything about them. What it does mean is that we don't, it will take slightly longer to help influence and reduce um, these emission sources because we don't have that direct control. Um, and the, and the, the main reason for that is because the significant proportion sit within our supply chain and our clients' footprints. So it doesn't mean we can't do anything about them. It does mean that it will take us that slightly longer to get there. Um, the other reason or the other reason that we've got 2035 as a key date is because we haven't resorted to offsetting as a primary solution. So at the moment, fundamentally, if we were to break down our footprint in the four key big areas we need to address, we could not achieve net zero any earlier than that without resorting to offsetting. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, that offsetting is right. What I am saying is that we haven't chosen as the primary solution um, to achieve net zero. Um, the reason for that is our logic and whole ethos around that is because rather than well, looking to invest and tangibly reduce the emission source at its source, as opposed to offsetting the residual footprint of the emission source at its heart. Um, so that's why we've got a date of 2035. You'll also notice that it's a climate change action plan. It is not a carbon action plan. The main reason for that is because climate change and carbon whilst it plays a massive part in addressing climate change, it is not the only thing to address to, in order to achieve, mitigate and truly um, tackle the impacts of climate change. So rather than create a plethora of action plans, so biodiversity action plan, a carbon action plan and every other action plan under the sun, what we've set out to do is we've set out through our climate change action plan a framework that essentially at the moment primarily focuses on carbon but as we're progressing the carbon and once we've got that rolling we will incorporate the other elements of climate change so actually what we've done is over the this was launched in the beginning of or well, end of 2019 and really publicized in the beginning of 2020 um, and what we did is we've set out the scene as to where we're going with carbon and we've got that rolling and whilst that continues to progress, what we're doing now is incorporating and weaving in the other elements of climate change that we're looking to address so around everything to do with natural capital and biodiversity is the next stream that we're weaving into this action plan. So the idea is that actually everything falls under that same umbrella and that same framework in order to achieve that consistency. Um, so the whole ethos of this plan is, and I think Richard mentioned it before of less is more and very, very much so in this instance or it, it, the whole premise of this is actually climate change in itself. We cannot tackle and the reason we focused on primarily in this instance, firstly on carbon and not try and do everything in one go is because as much as I would like to and as much as Costain would like to, realistically, it is not feasible at the moment to try and address all of climate change in one go. So we haven't actually tried to. What we have done is, OK, whilst we recognise that we can't address everything to do with climate change in one step, one hit, what we have done is map out, OK, we're focusing, we've really honed in and focused on the net zero agenda and trying to break that down to really determine, OK, within that, what do we need to do within our net zero space? And actually, in that same vein, net zero can't be done in one sole hit. So again, we haven't tried to solve and achieve net zero in one sole hit. This plan is a 15 year plan. We've not tried to do everything in year one. What we have done is we've got a very clear breakdown of where we're going, why we're doing it, and what needs to happen in what order to get there. Um, so yeah, um, and I'm the first to admit this plan is not perfect. No plan is at the moment. However, what it is doing, it is very much informed by data as opposed to perceptions to ensure that we really are homing in on the right elements. So what does the plan actually focus on? Um, as I mentioned, there's four key areas. And actually, why does our plan only focus on four key areas? And I will lay all there in a second. Um, so when we did that whole mapping exercise of understanding, OK, what is cost gains of a whole life cycle footprint? And I can tell you now, the data isn't perfect for the industry, 100%, but actually most of it is there. So even if the picture isn't super, super clear, we've got a pretty good and robust idea of actually 
what the picture looks like. So we're continuing to improve the data, but we can set that line in the sand of understanding actually as of where we are today, where are we at? And when we did this exercise of mapping out and trying to really understand actually what does make up our whole life cycle footprint, it essentially flagged that the four key areas make up 96% of that, the entirety of that whole life cycle footprint. So in the same vein as we can't tackle climate change in one go, so we've only focused on net zero for now, um, or within this plan, only focused on net zero. In that same vein, actually, we can't achieve net zero go. And realistically, from the work that we've undertook, we identified that actually focusing on four key areas is would be nailing 96% of that whole life cycle emissions. So this plan actually only tackles 96% of our whole life cycle footprint. That doesn't mean that we won't address the remaining 4%. What it does mean is this plan ensures that we focus on the truly biggest hotspots and really take those to town. And then in time, we will address the other elements of that. Um, but these are by a long shot priority areas. So what are those emission hotspots? Um, and I will go into a bit more detail on what we're doing in that space. Um, but the key, and it's no surprise, there is nothing that I'm going to tell you that should be coming as much of a surprise. Um, what we are doing different to what's previous potentially been done in the industry is recognising those hotspots, one thing, but really tangibly driving change within those spaces um, and not just within costing, but actually at, at that industry level as well. Um, so design is a massive part, and I know Matt, mentioned previously around PAS 2080. So the whole life cycle of similar to how we've gone about our plan, and it's all very repetitive, this whole carbon side of things, but understanding the whole life cycle of our designs and our projects as a whole, not just the design, the, the construction phase of it, but also once it's life, but understanding that whole picture of how much an asset or infrastructure or a network, pipeline network, for example, has a part playing that what that whole life cycle footprint enables to then identify actually what can you change to make the biggest difference at that very early design phase so actually the whole design space that that phase plays a critical part in making net zero a reality um because if we miss the bit if we miss the boat there whilst change is still feasible later down the line it is very much retrospective and it is a lot harder i think we that there is a general consensus that the earlier you're involved, the greater the opportunity. But really nailing and filtering down into actually, okay, great, what within design, which bits the biggest areas to focus on is a key part. So design plays a massive part. Um, another one is around um, our corporate fleets and vehicle fleets. And that's not just company cars. So there is a focus on company cars, makes up a big proportion, but it's also the car announced individuals within cost names and organisation. Because actually, if we only focus on company cars, whilst again, that's an easier one to control because we have direct control over the company car fee, we would only be tackling half of our staff travel footprint because only 50% of our staff have company cars, the other 50% potentially have a company car or car announced. So actually we set out plans for what we're going to do to address both of the emissions from both of those hotspots, which is not the easy option, but it is the one that would legitimately drive a tangible change. And it's not all just about vehicle fleets. There's a big part to play just due to the sheer nature of what we do and the scale and size of the infrastructure projects that we're involved with. And that's um, whilst it's a very, very construction related part of the activity, we can still make changes to influence that is design is around the type of plant and machinery that we either design something to be delivered by or that we use during a delivery phase and it might seem quite a rudimentary topic you know excavators and dumpers there's maybe more cooler areas for some people to work in but actually just due to the nature of the activities and the nature of the machines and the scale and size actually it plays a phenomenal part or quite a substantial part in the industry's footprint so there is a really big focus on nailing emissions from plant and machinery, um, which does play a big part. And so we've got a, a big space around the, the vehicle and plant machinery footprint. So design, plant machinery footprint, and then lastly, energy. Um, and again, 
the energy piece is not just making sure that we're on a green tariff um, when we're at a delivery phase or that our offices are in green um, energy. So there's a big part in ensuring that actually all of our permanent and temporary accommodation is on the cleanest renewable sources possible. There is also a really big focus on ensuring that we reduce our general consumption overall. Um, and it's not just about the offices or the temporary or permanent offices that we occupy. It's also around the energy efficiency of the designs that we have again. So these are all quite interlinked. Um, but yeah, so, and I will go into a little bit more detail around those in a minute, but um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our climate plane action plan focuses on those four key plates. And then, sorry, the last one I forgot to mention. Um, so design, plant machinery, the energy and materials. And materials by a long shot, as I mentioned, you know, so those four key areas make up 60, 96% of our group footprint. And the materials is the one that blows it all out of the water. And very much, Matthew touched on it very much so, the embodied footprint of the infrastructure that we're either designing, delivering or optimising is quite a phenomenal part of the UK industries or the UK carbon footprint um, and it's not whilst every material has a carbon footprint actually the key main offenders just due to the nature of their carbon intensity um, is no surprise it's concrete steel and aggregates um, that doesn't mean that the other materials and other bits aren't uh, of relevance to focus on but actually in the first instance they are by a long shot the three biggest areas that we really need to start tackling now um, in order to get anywhere close to getting to net zero um, and so our plan very much focuses on materials but very specifically on concrete steel and aggregate to ensure that we don't lose sight of tackling the those areas. That doesn't mean that we won't continue to innovate in other spaces. What this does ensure is that we do remain focused on those biggest hotspots. Um, so it really is driving that change. And the reason that we focused on those in particular as well is not just due to the sheer intensity of them, but also the current reliance on those materials in our industry is phenomenal. And it's not going to change overnight. And we appreciate that although we have a 15 year timeline, there is this, this plan is still very much an ambitious timeline to achieve. And some of these things are going to be incremental changes and it's not gonna always be as easy. And there is a lot of things that need to marry up in order to get there. So what this plan does is also make sure that we focus on these things now to make sure that we do start those changes because it isn't gonna happen overnight and in one go, but it is feasible to do. So whilst our plan is stretching, it is definitely achievable. So those four key areas, and just if we can flick onto the next slide, please. As I mentioned, this isn't just my magic numbers or you know, me sat in a corner figuring out what is the greatest hotspots. It is very much informed by data and any organizational scale, regardless of the size, the type of industry you're in or the type of organization, the data won't be perfect, right? The data isn't perfect. So but what that is, that there is a huge amount of data there. It is currently a little bit siloed. You know, there's more to be done and there is a lot of work going on in the industry to unlock that. Um, however, data is key to ensuring and flagging actually, whilst you might not have the perfect data and the data sets, and you might be putting a bit of information from here, there and everywhere, you can paint a picture of what your current carbon footprint is made up of. Um, and from that, you can have an honest look at understanding, okay, but actually of the 10 items or however many it is, three of these or five of these make up the majority of my footprint. So rather than trying to tackle everything, okay, let's really home in and take, in, take to town those hotspot areas, but then map out and follow through with it. And so our whole approach around this is driving consistency around, it is not me or some of pet projects or perceptions of where we need to do this stuff. There's some brilliant ideas that are going on, but actually not all of them are addressing some of the key pivotal hotspots we need to address. So what we've been doing is ensuring that we, as objectively as possible, and using as informed data as we can, ensure that we have those baselines to understand this is where we're at, this is where we need to get to, and then really mapping out what are the stepping stones in order to get there, because it's no easy feast. And then 
using data again to make sure that actually what we're doing is making a genuine change. Um, so that's been a really key part in making that happen. And that for me is one of the fundamental things in net zero is having clarity of actually where do you start? And what is of most relevance to focus on? Um, and you can only do that through understanding or unpicking, demystifying actually what do the numbers, what does the information say? The key danger is, and I'll point it out now because I think our industry can be a little bit victim of it sometimes, is there is always opportunity to dig in deeper to the data. And whilst I'm not saying that you're doing it just on an estimate, there is a time of understanding whilst we can continue to improve the data, we don't need it to be absolutely perfect in order to understand where some of these hotspots are. Um, and you can go into information overload after a while of being overwhelmed with so much data that you don't know when to look. So there is a fine balance to be had, but it is feasible to do. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so bringing our plan to life. So what I've just outlined is a plan in itself. And, but a plan is as good as the piece of paper or the PDF it's written, right? It's really bringing in a life that actually makes this genuinely going to drive change. You can have the best plan in the world, realistically. If you don't follow through on it, it just remains a plan. So with that in mind, we have three key work streams that all sort of work in parallel. Um, that bring this plan to life. And so what does that mean? So there is a big focus on addressing and making sure that we reduce and achieve that whole life cycle group footprint of achieving net zero by 2035. And there's some very tangible things around putting, you know, plant idling metrics in place and things like that, and, and changing and rolling out a car fleet transition plan for our vehicles, things that we can do that are very tangible. Um, but in addition to that, some of the the other work streams around that and to help, especially around that design phase. Um, it's not just about putting in metrics, but what we have put as an interim solution between now and 2035 is that by 2023, so that's just two years away, in two years time, we will be offering a low, at least one low carbon option, low carbon solutions with every offering that we provide. Um, so that doesn't mean, what that does mean, whilst that doesn't mean it'll get taken forward every time. We totally get some of these things might not take enough first time around. However, what it is doing is ensuring that we're not waiting to be asked to prompt the questions, but it, and this is going to be reflected. That doesn't mean we'll be doing an alternative bid every time. The idea is the low carbon, the, the, the offering that's put forward is going to be reflective of the scale and the size of what we do. So sometimes it could be a complete alternative bid. Whereas sometimes it might just be a case of pointing out to that relevant client, actually, you're missing a trick if you don't do this, or you've got an opportunity to do this here. We know you haven't asked, but. Um, and that's really key because it's driving the right behaviours in that sense. And that's setting the first line in the sand in order to get to anywhere close to providing whole life cycle net zero solutions as the default 2030, if not before. So all of these dates are flexible. If we can bring them forward, we 100% will do. A key part of enabling and saying, you know, it's all great for me to say we're going to be offering 20 by in two years time low carbon options. But for us to be able to do that, we have to ensure that we have our own ducks in a row as an organisation, both um, to ensure that we have the mechanisms in place to not make this super owner, onerous but understanding actually using data again to inform actually how do we go about this consistently and actually deliver on this. And PAS 2080 has been a real shaper in ensuring that we've got the framework in place to make this a pretty slick and painless process to do. This is not trying to reinvent the wheel and it's not adding a whole new work stream to what we do. What it is doing is making sure that A, we capture everything that we already do because there are some amazing stuff that goes on in the industry. We're just not always very good at recognising it for a start and then actually capturing how much those savings are achieved and shouting that loudly. And secondly, it's building on demonstrating actually all the good stuff that we've done. We do it maybe a little bit in a pocket, making that the mainstream and the norm. So it is very much making net zero the mainstream and the norm thing to do. Um, so there's a big piece on low carbon solutions offering. And then lastly, for that industry leading change piece, because what I'm addressing as flagging is the key hotspot areas for you, uh, for me, are also the very much the key hotspots area for the industry. So actually, if you were to look at all sorts of different plans around net zero, 
we, we all essentially have the same emission hotspots. We don't all have the same influence on those emission hotspots, but actually we all have the key, fun, the key fundamental challenges. So this isn't just about cost and doing it in our little space in the world. The whole point is ensuring that we can really help make this the industry mainstream norm. And so understanding as an organisation, how much do we currently contribute to clean growth? And that's not just us directly, but actually with our supply chains and our clients' footprint. And how much could we potentially do? And within the energy space, that plays a huge part. So actually understanding how much do we play a part in not only generating clean and renewable energy on the UK networks, but actually how much are we playing a part in incorporating and making sure that the infrastructure that we provide in transportation or in water is equipped to using those clean and renewable energy power sources sort of because it's all great providing and producing this energy but actually if we then don't have the connection into making sure that we use it in the right areas of where it's most needed you're kind of only answering half the question so these are three work streams that are all very much going on in parallel there's the very tangible things of what they're doing in the here and now on our contracts and stuff there's a piece around shaping what we're doing in the solutions piece and then lastly, around that wider industry growth and clean growth piece is really understanding what is our current contribution showing. And it's not just our bit, it's also raising the awareness of actually this is how much we play a part. We have an opportunity to make quite dead in the UK footprint, but it's going to take everyone to come to the party in order to get there. And then so if we move on to the next slide again, thank you. This is all very good, but in the here and now and those three work streams, how are they again still getting brought to life because I, I appreciate that as statements and it's taken it can seem really simplistic but actually the way that we're making all of this happen on our contract be it that delivery phase a design phase consultancy or an asset optimization phase is through what we've designed as a, and it's an internal tool but it's very much applicable to any type of organisation and external tool was developed internally originally and it's called our resource efficiency matrix. So what is the resource efficiency matrix? It is a tool. It's not going to give you the answer. What it does is using it helps you identify actually where is the biggest bang for your buck in terms of where you're at in that life cycle of contract and within what's in your genuine scope of influence. So it's not trying to go down a rabbit hole. It really sort of helps bring to life where are the hotspots in your the biggest hotspots in your area and opportunity and gift to influence. But what it is, is it's a maturity matrix. It's a maturity matrix that breaks down into three different levels. So this is very much building that iterative process of the shaping steps. So bronze is actually what's now our basic standard and our minimum standard. Silver is actually setting your stall out in terms of shaping and getting sure that for each of the areas that that matrix focuses on, that you have got the relevant data, that you're putting it together and you're using the data to map out actually where's your hotspot, hashing out a reduction plan so this is how we can, can reduce it. And then gold is nothing more than making sure that you have the assurance models demonstrating that actually that plan that you've brought into place, you're actually following through on it. And what we do is we apply this across the entirety of business and we have done for the last three years. Um, because originally this was designed before we had the climate change action plan, so which again shows that we've been rolling this out for quite a while. What it shows is that through this mechanism of bringing this to life is that over the last three years, following through on this has really, what has enabled us to achieve over 49 million pounds worth of capital and operational cost savings for ourselves, our clients and our supply chains, but also reduced just under 2 million tonnes of carbon emissions um, since its launch. And it's very much aligned to PAS 2080. It helps bring to life the clarity of roles and responsibilities, because this isn't all just about environmentalists doing it. Everyone has a part to play. What it does do is map out who's got a part to play when. Um, and yeah, so this is the tool with which we're really bringing this to life to help illustrate um, and for, for everyone to be able to use this um, as part of making that zero a reality um, and I'm more than happy to discuss and take any questions on this and that. so yeah so I think that's fine if I'm not mistaken my last slide so go to the last one but yeah thank you so much hopefully that's been helpful and provide clarity of how we've got about it and how it can definitely 
be transposed into all the picture for yourselves as well. OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Lara. Well, that's nice. Good to hear. Um, quite a methodical and structured approach to, to solving the problem um, and recognising that it's not a five minute job to sort it out. Um, yeah, I quite like it. And um, I was just I was interested um, just picking up on one or two of the things you said um, about um, allowing enough time for design processes. And, and also I was wondering if there was enough time allowed for construction, um, bearing in mind there's always pressure to complete projects in in the short shortest time period based on the theory that quicker is cheaper. Yeah. Um, but but actually would do you feel that more enough time is allowed for sort of carbon friendly construction that can be done in a careful, more methodical way um, to to reduce consumption, to reduce waste? And, and give give more time for things to be planned properly. Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. I think at the moment we actually we the the balance is a bit off kilter, and essentially it's understanding. So actually, if we're able to frame, well, you know what, we can give a design, but realistically, if you spend an additional three months actually mapping this out, your delivery will be quicker. But it's rebalancing, not just focusing on it's. The balance between a commercial, the time constraints and carbon, it's not saying that one's got a priority on the others. What it is saying is actually understanding and having that balance across all of the different priorities to understand where it is. So at the moment, I don't think there is sufficient time for that. I don't think it's not necessarily through not wanting to or not being able to. I think we would be technically able to do so. I think the key part is we're not incentivized to. So the business models that we follow in terms of allowing and ensuring that it's genuinely efficient from a sustainable perspective on the construction or from a delivery and a design perspective um, is that actually we don't have all of the, 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 the business models incentivized to ensure that we are doing that and actually where it does and there, I'm not saying that everyone does them where we have tried to put forward carbon targets as part of some of these key metrics where actually, you know, cost is a factor, time is a factor, carbon is a, a huge factor that is a priority. Setting the standard of actually the tone of this is where we're focusing. There needs to be, it needs to be taken into account one thing, but also then holding accountable and ensuring it does. So that might in some instances be being bold enough or brave enough to point out of actually realistically if we're going to do this properly we are going to have to take another month of doing something but actually what we will have is clarity and not trying to push into potentially a delivery phase to then retrospectively try and identify some carbon savings so it's more um ensuring at the moment i don't think it's there i think it's feasible to do it but i think what we do have to acknowledge and it's not just one entity in the value chain that's going to make this happen. It's for every organisation along that chain to point out actually some of maybe the elephants in the room that we know or some of the key things that actually fundamentally are not favouring carbon reduction and probably a hindrance to it. Um, and that's more having the awkward conversations around, you know, some of the top topics that I've mentioned here. None of it's new. The difference is we haven't moved from using, we know where low carbon concrete is, works. We know where it doesn't work at the moment or it's not really suitable. However, we haven't really jumped from the space of dabbling and redoing the same trial about a bazillion times in all sorts of different contracts to make an actually taking the stance of we can make this mainstream. We can't put a blanket rule everywhere, but we do know where this is suitable to use and that could be an industry standard. Just as an example, it's actually some of these things, it's really the assurance and the accountability piece of following through on it as well. So it, it, it's a balance of everything. Yeah, exactly. So whole whole life carbon costs, I think you mentioned, and and, and really, um, car, the carbon, the cost of construction needs to be a proper metric that's evaluated uh, with with a with a with an offer of, yeah. Definitely, definitely, definitely. and mm. I think making not making carbon a dark car is a really good one. I think we have been past. I mean, you can make carbon a dark mm. car if you want to, but. The whole point is very much demystifying the topic and making this accessible and relatable to everyone. We don't need yeah. everyone to be a carbon expert. No, you mentioned also data and, and you're collecting yeah. data. That's the, I mean, it's it, it's it's um, it's one thing to create um, algorithms to, to work out carbon um, 
footprints and demands and things. But actually, if you haven't got the data behind it, it's um, it's not really very useful. So that that's probably a really valuable thing that's being done is to collect the data of, of um, CO2 emissions on construction activities. So that would be um, a really useful thing to share maybe um, in future. So I'm um, conscious of, oh, wait a minute, there are questions. Uh, I didn't see them there. There's, there's, uh, there's one around designers. Yes. A good question around the huge challenge of getting designers to consider design yeah. at this stage. Yeah. So how have we gone about it? And it's not just one thing that enables this. There is a very clear bit it's around actually this isn't an optional thing to have. It's kind of part of the designer's remit. They play a pivotal yeah. part in it. And I'm not going to tell a designer how to do it. I can equip a designer with understanding actually these are the metrics we need to ensure that we address. But it's actually allocating the roles and responsibility of actually this bit's my bag, that bit's your bag can certainly help. Um, there is a key part around that whole accountability piece. So within costing, that's very much led from all the way through the executive board, all the way down. So actually, the head of design, the head of supply chain, they're very clear around what their remits are and what their responsibilities are and actually making net zero happen. It's not just all for the environmental or the sustainability team to do or inform. So a key part is for me assigning roles and responsibilities, but also holding accountable um, because I'm pretty sure most designers will have sustainability as part of their job role, their job spec, etc. But then actually are they incentivized to do anything around it? And is there any assurance around making sure they do it where they do there is recognition of that, but also mm. recognition that they may be um, it, it is actually a lot more effort for everybody to um to think it to think this way and, and how efficient they can be in, in terms of carbon. Uh, because we're all sort of geared towards thinking efficiently in terms of cost. Yeah. Um, so it is a lot more. It is a lot harder to go down this road, but but it's one that we we have to do, and that's everybody with the supply chain need to cooperate as well. Um, oh, massively. That yeah. is a big part to play, and I think education yeah. is a big one. It's also about understanding. So not needing everyone to be yeah. a carbon expert is one thing, but having an appreciation of actually what does carbon mean in your world. So for designers, yes. I'm not going to call it carbon, but that, yeah. That might lead quite nicely on to the, the last question, which is uh, what's got, uh, Costain's definition of carbon zero? So net zero, we have very much aligned with the um, UK's um, definition for net zero around um, the 1.5 degree scenarios of what needs to be addressed. Um, so yeah, we've taken that as an approach. I think there is and there was definitely at the beginning a lot of uncertainty actually around what does net zero mean. Um, but yeah, we've taken that definition very much in line to the science based targets and the climate, the climate okay. definition. Yeah. OK, um, I'm not seeing any more questions um, there, so um, I think that's probably it. So thank you very much, thank Laura. So that's much. Um, Absolutely interesting presentation on on Costain's activities and on big projects. So great, great for that. Thank you very much. And um, I think we're coming up to another break now. Um, so the idea is we'll have 10 minutes, actually 12 minutes um, break now. So if we could um, restart at um, 20 to 5. Uh, for the last presentation of the, the day from Alex Gray from of Thames Water. Thank you. <laughs>